Hey, Nicotine. So uh, thanks for your response. I just watched the very beginning of uh, In Mendham's response to you, and he commended you for your bravery in responding to my video, which um, I don't really understand what he means. But I'm not going to watch the rest of Gary's video until I respond to you, because he's going to draw me off track into a whole other uh, emotional you know, state, and uh, I wanted to respond to you before I really focus on what Gary's trying to do to the, the set of ideas that we've expressed and exchanged. So, um, you know, you were saying that you agree that consciousness is elusive, and um, that, uh, it, you know, it's the one remaining mystery that science really hasn't explained yet, uh, and you know, you've read Daniel Dennett's book, Consciousness Explained, and uh, you seem to think that he hasn't really explained it. And you know, I agree with you, of course. Um, I really appreciate all of Dennett's work because he is a no BS kind of guy when it comes to philosophical explanations, which is to say that uh, he is a materialist and a reductionist, though not a greedy reductionist. Uh, he's a reductionist in the sense that he thinks reality is made with cranes instead of skyhooks. Or at least that's the metaphor he likes to use a lot of times in a lot of his writing, in a lot of his books. <clears throat> and, um, you know, it's interesting that right now I'm actually trying to defend two seemingly opposite ideas at the same time, which is, you know, I just made a video about reincarnation, but I also just made a video about um, the Omega Point, and I've been trying to defend the Omega Point, or the idea that the future has a role to play in the present. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to defend both the idea that the past, in the form of reincarnation and inheritance uh, of, of past deeds, uh, and that the future and the anticipation um, of future possibilities both play a role in this present moment and in all of the present moments which have been and will be in our universe. So it's not just that the mechanical causes of the past determine what happens now. It's not that we can only understand you know, the current state of complexity of the biosphere of planet Earth, say, in terms of, you know, random gene mutation and natural selection based on, you know, this principle of the survival of the fittest. That explanation based on the past of the present isn't complete, I would say. Certainly the past plays a role, which is why I say reincarnation is true in a non-trivial sense, not in the sense that individual souls survive the death of one body and migrate to a new body depending upon, you know, the exact moral, uh, you know, level of virtuosity that their uh, past lives uh, expressed into, you know, a particular form of uh, body in, in a subsequent generation, but rather reincarnation in terms of, uh, you know, genetic inheritance. And I don't just mean genes, which, you know, in, in terms of the metaphor, which I want to get to also, the gene is as much a metaphor as you're ever going to get. It doesn't actually exist in the physiology, uh, in, 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 you know, the microcellular biology of, um, of genetics. The gene is an abstraction. Um, you know, the idea of a discrete set of um, or, or a slice of uh, the DNA sequence being um, a one-to-one, -one, you know, causal sign of or algorithm or recipe for producing a single specific trait is, is in almost every case, besides a few trivial um, exceptions, a complete abstraction. It's it's uh, an idealization of something which is far more complex. So, 
when I say genetic inheritance, I mean more than just the inheritance of genes or the inheritance of, of memes, which, you know, when I say reincarnation is about um, archetypes being expressed throughout human history. I don't mean in, in, in the sense of Dawkins' memes or, or mere mimicries of, of the past. Um, it's, uh, you know, reincarnation is not just of these discrete atomic memes. It's of a whole context of embedded meaning. Uh, you know, an archetype, first of all, is unconscious. You can't knowingly repeat it. You become it. You are it. You know, it's the, the underlying um, formal cause of your own existence. And so it is you. You know, it's not as though you choose to express an archetype. The archetype expresses you, or you are the archetype. And a meme seems to be more like a mask, and it's a very, you know, I've said this in other videos, you know, a video I posted actually like two years ago about memes and archetypes, that uh, a meme implies that there's a dualism between the mind and the body, between the soul and the face, in one sense. But there is, in other words, desire trapped on the inside of the body. Um, part of its desire is, is to survive, part of it is to reproduce, right? This is just straight Darwinism. Um, and that this soul then repeats in a cultural way, in a, in a, um, a symbolic way, what it observes other uh, humans doing, other souls, or souls expressing themselves through faces. It mimics the faces of others. And so the mimetic theory of cultural evolution, it, it, you know, it acknowledges desire, and so in, in a sense is a psychology, and psyche meaning soul, but it doesn't acknowledge, um, you know, what, what we could call the spirit. And, you know, Nicotine, you, you said that I like to use these religious metaphors, and that you don't argue with metaphors, and, you know, I, I respect that, I can understand what you mean. but. Uh, you know, why would I distinguish the spirit from the soul? Well, because there is a desire underlying all desires, and that is the desire for enlightenment, or salvation, um, or for extinction of suffering, um, or for happiness. You know, there are many ways of talking about what this basic underlying reason for human existence um, many ways of talking about it, about what it might be, but that is the desire of desires, and all the other desires that we usually attribute this with uh, attribute to the soul are trivial, or, or at least more trivial. You know, sex and and death do not uh, cover all the bases. I think that there there's spirit as well. There's this desire for something transcendent. And, um, you know, what we, what we say about it will always be metaphorical, because we can't see it. And all our words are, you know, they are derived from, from our embodied sensory experience. So we can only approximate what spirit might mean. But that doesn't mean we don't have uh, at least the capability or the capacity of fully experiencing it in, in a way that can't be contained by language. So, you know, Descartes is someone that you mentioned, and oh, I've only got 28 seconds, but, you know, this idea that I think, therefore I am, is really, it is a very profound statement. I mean, it ranks right up there with, uh, Socrates saying that philosophy begins in wonder in terms of the, uh, the most influential phrases in Western thought, um, philosophical thought at least, but 